Now this is a painted crayfish and they're really common to the reefs up here. Now the reason you have to spare them is because they won't go into a pot and they're really good to eat. So if you want one, you gotta go and get it. From the latitude of 38 degrees south to this place on August the 22nd, 1770. So this is where it all started. Now you wouldn't believe it, but also on this island there's an old gold mine. There's a hundred islands here and I'd ask myself why this one? But up there it's a gold mine. We'll go and have a look. just makes you realise how tough those blokes were at the turn of the century. They came in here and hacked this hole out of the rock and it looks like it's made a great home for some bats. Hey, amazing, how good's a gecko? Gecko. Oh, we have a spider, it's a huntsman. It's made a great home for a lot of little animals. And look at the wasp nests. God, look at that. Cockroach heaven. And a paint over here to clean them up. And that's Underwater. I'm not just being relaxed, isn't it? You've got to... yeah. another name for it and they're really considered top quality eating fish because they have almost no bones so you get great big slabs of fish you don't have to worry about picking out bones this is only a baby they can grow to about 20 30 kilograms Got 
Yep. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Little lady. A lot of people say better eat in the barrow. It's a bit close quarters. Yes! There we go. Love the nice. Now you don't want to eat this plate, Rob, do you? You do? You only get one side. You've been for Barrow Monday. Yeah. <laughs> yes! Open up, open up. Actually, I think it was mine anyway, you man. Yeah, it was, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Getting close. Start the tire a little bit. Yes! <laughs> well, they're too heavy for me to lift, you'll have to lift him in. <laughs> nice fish, Tim. Yeah, you had a flash on him there. Oh, yes! <laughs> yes! Oh, he's off. Hey, Paul's got one! <laughs> Oh, yeah. Under your chin. Yeah, he's after it. Yeah, he's after it. Yes, we're on. Yes. They're after it. They're after it. They're after it. Oh! 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 Get a bit, he takes a bit. <laughs> Wouldn't want him to bite you. Here it comes, here it comes. Another big fish. Oh! 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 Done. We saw. <laughs> oh, come on. Yeah, it was only a small fish, mate. <laughs> Wasn't big enough to take the hook. <laughs> no doubt about they want these blue ones. Oh, he's right here at the end. See that big swell? Uh, right at that. Oh! oh. Put the you got one too there, have you? <laughs> Oh, it's fine, here, just there, right in front of you. He's down to the anchor rope. He's coming around now. Hang on. Yeah, put yours up, I think. Uh, Thank you, Tim. Can you feed the line the right underneath the, um, the anchor rope? Yeah. Okay, okay, he's on this one now. Queen fish. <laughs> Beautiful looking fish. Not real good to eat. Good for a curry though. He's up in it. Come on. Yeah, there. Oh mate, he's just he's just playing dirty. He won't come behind you. He's right behind the boat. Is he around the anchor rope or he's under it? No, he's, he's, he's oh, under him, see? Yeah. Good day, Gary. Yeah, good to see you again. 
I believe you're a grandfather too. Indeed, just. <laughs> Again. And this is? Uh, this is Robbie Rattle, the Barefoot Bushman. Ralph. Yeah, please meet you. Bye, Carl. Bye. We normally end up with about close to half a million larvae, or half a million spat, a lot more larvae, anything up to several million larvae. But I mean, a single oyster can produce 60 million eggs. So the survival rate's not too good, uh, even under control oh, conditions? No, we, 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 even under control, we've got as much as 15% survival, which is really good, yeah. compared with in the wild, where it's 0.0001% ever survive in the wild. Mm. So, uh, we, do, we do everything fr right from the beginning. We actually take the brood stock and we spawn it, we breed the oysters from larvae, we bring them up and we tend them for three years before we actually seed them or nucleate them for round pearls and then we look after them for another two years and then we harvest the pearls and we actually process the pearls and we market them direct. So. We do it right from the beginning, we go all the way through. Do you breed? Well, we have to breed our own oysters because there's very few wild oysters left. They've all been, uh, all, the, all the beds have been destroyed from overfishing and trawling and uh, poor management. And there's, you, there's a lot of reasons. They had sickness go right through as well. When, mm. the, when the Japanese first started pearl farming, they used the Japanese methods, which was intensive, and that proved disastrous for our big uh, northern oysters and, uh, and disease spread through the farms and, uh, and that destroyed the whole industry at one stage. There's so many things but it all adds up so there's no pearl oysters left in the wild. Yeah. Now most people think it's the pearl they were after but in the early days it wasn't was it? That was it's, just a, a byproduct. That's wasn't it? right. Yeah. Now they used to fish for the pearl shell because uh, they didn't have plastics in them uh -huh. days and all your buttons in the world were made from pearl stuff. Right, so. Well, uh, Mickey Moto is usually credited with the uh, invention of it, but in fact the patent for the technique to produce a round pearl was actually granted to two other Japanese, a, a uh, Dr. Nishikawa and a Mr. T. Mize. They actually took out a patent for this technique and neither of them had uh, had any experience in the pearling industry. They didn't know each other, and yet within a week of each other, they put applications for this patent for the technique to produce a round pearl. And they, it, the, tech, the patent was actually granted to Dr. Nishikawa to be jointly owned by Mr. T. Myers. And uh, Mikimoto then took it to glory, but they actually had the patent. And although they'd never met each other and, and didn't know each other, they did have one thing in common, in that they were both in the Torres Straits with the Arafura pearling fleet, fishing for pearl shell, at the very time that a fella called, um, oh, what was his name, Several Gary? Kent. Several Kent, yeah. He was the Commissioner of Fisheries for Queensland. 
because it was such a big industry in those days that the Commissioner of Fisheries for Queensland was stationed in Thursday Island. And he um, started a pearl farm over on Albany growing half pearls, which was developed by the Chinese hundreds of years ago. And he spent years experimenting with how to make a round pearl. And he was the first one to actually discover the technique. And Dr Nishikawa and Mr T Mize were both fisheries officers with the Arafura Pearling Fleet at the very time that Savile Kent just couldn't help telling everybody who cared to listen <laughs> about his technique that he'd discovered, because he died then very soon after, and no, nothing was ever heard of it. They went home, patented it, Mikimoto then took it to glory, and from then on it's been the great Japanese secret. Yeah. In reality, a Queenslander, an Australian, a Queenslander, the Commissioner of Fisheries for Queensland, Savile Kent, he actually invented the technique for producing a round pearl. <laughs> A lot of divers used to die off the bends and we've, there's graves all over the place around these islands, especially in Thursday Island. Uh, they're still there, Japanese graves of the, all the divers that used to die, the Japanese. But um, in those days, it was a macho thing for the young university students to volunteer for a season with the Arafura Pearling Fleet diving. I mean, they'd have a season out here, they'd go home, they'd talk about it for the rest of their lives, you know, it was it was a great thing. For, adventure. Oh, it was wonderful because living in Japan in the in the cities, they just, uh, it was just so exotic and it was the thing to do, to volunteer for a They didn't get paid much and it was very dangerous but they didn't realise that. But it's like kid, the boys everywhere, they'll volunteer for the army, they'll go and fight for the, you know, they just it's excitement, it's adventure. When you're young you don't think you can die, do you? That's right, you'd, you'd never ever give a thought to dying. And that's right. Of course a lot of them used to uh, die of the bends, but majority, when you look at all the gravestones in Thursday Island Cemetery, you'll find the majority of them are between 18 and 21. They're all, because they're all university students that uh, came out here to volunteer for a season of the diving. This is a monument erected in the memory of the Japanese pearl divers, and it says, from 1788 till 1941, thousands of Japanese were employed in the gathering of pearl shells. That was the principal enterprise of the Northern Australia. They worked hard together with the island people, contributing to the development of the fishing industry. And during this period, approximately 700 Japanese people died in the Torres Strait area. May the Japanese rest in peace here, it says. During the war, how many around here? Well, probably eight to ten that we know of. Uh, certainly, uh, uh, we've got records of that many. Not all of them have been found, though. And why did they crash? Oh, the majority of them, especially the um, Aero Cobras, ran out of fuel. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess returning from the sort of missions that yeah. they did up there, it was fairly commonplace. You know, they just used up more fuel than they expected. Our tail gunner's turret. Yeah, it wouldn't be the best position on the aircraft, Rob. I don't think there'd be too that. many uh, volunteers for that job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this aircraft crashed on takeoff uh, very early in the morning in Misty Rain. Uh, 
nose dives into the ground, stalled at about 400 feet with a full bomb load on board. Not and, a good uh, thing to do. No, it's for sure. Actually, went in inverted too. So, uh, Big. Yeah, she's a fair size. It's got a bit of a list on it too, isn't it? Fall over, eh? It's like you kind of lean over a little bit. <laughs> this was an early warning system to uh, protect the base down on the seafront here against uh, approaching Japanese aircraft. The uh, Japanese uh, bombers bombed Horn Island on 16 occasions over there and uh, most of the raids are at night time. Just watch your fingers, there's a red-backed spider there. Is there? <laughs> yeah, just that two inches <laughs> from your fingers. You don't find them too often in this part of the world. This was a, a radar facility that was protecting uh, the American Liberty ships that used to come into this base down here yep. below us. And uh, they were supplying uh, foodstuffs, arms and ammunition, and some personnel were boarded here too. Uh, to go up to the campaign where they were fighting the Japanese in the southern part of uh, PNG, I think. Okay. There's a real big female red back here, mate. She's got eggs, mate. Yeah, she's a big girl. Oh, yeah? Yep. Okay, right over. Just hang on a second, I'll run over. Where is he? He's underneath us. There. To the left. Just shut the motor down. He may roll again. There they are. Come towards it. Yeah, good shot. Yeah, go, go. Go, be excited. Where? See where the wing rolls over? That's where the fish will sit, just inside the wing. No, he's here in front of me. Yeah, right in front of me. Well, both fins come up. Heading off over that way, go. Oh, that's bloody magnificent, isn't it? He's got a good spread, that bloke. Yeah. Right across there he is. See? Yeah. Oh, there he is, right here. Yep. Isn't that beautiful, isn't it? Now we've got uh, two pin shot. The creek, as it begins to ebb, and, They're coming out towards and us discharge now. along this flat here, the left a bit more. pumps a lot of small left. prawns out. It's not something that probably a lot of people are aware that you can do. Even. Yeah, you I see the mantas so. going past and they just say, oh, what a lovely big manta. <laughs> <laughs> and then didn't steam away from yeah, them. Didn't sit underneath. <laughs> <laughs> there we go, he's coming up on the Let's see if we can stay in front of him. Come here! Yes! Alright! Oh, yes! <laughs> and he's a 
Hear that line sing? <laughs> Keep the strain on him, mate. Love him, mate. Do. I somehow think that the ray went under him. He went under the ray again. And that's what happened. The ray took off with him. Yes! Let him go! There he is, look, on the surface there. Yoo-hoo! Well done, Robbie. Yeah, good on you, mate. Good on you, Gary. It's like a shark, isn't it? Yeah, they do when they come forward. He can pull with the little devil. You can try and keep working away from it, though. best if you can keep them close to the surface. Yeah. Well, I hope he's wearing out, because I am. <laughs> he doesn't like the look of that, mate. Oh, they're a tough fish. They, they hang in and hang in. Nice and easy. Nice and easy. Come on, mate. Okay, lift him up there. <laughs> Pass the gap up anyway. Bloody you your feet, that's all. Well done, Robert. <laughs> well executed, mate. Not Thanks. just the cast, but playing the fish as well. Sorry about that, fellas. You've joined an elite band of people. Yeah. <laughs> that have taken a cobia roof from out of eight. Yes! <laughs> wow. Now this is really a fish. <laughs> Look at that, eh? Wow. <laughs> Magnificent. Just down there is the most northerly tip of mainland Australia. Now I'm actually standing in the Great Dividing Range. And as little as six and a half thousand years ago, there'd be no water there, it would have all been land. And instead of fish out there, there would have been Aboriginals living. Here I am at the top, and I'm gonna try and catch myself a fish off the tip. Not very big, but it's still a fish. <laughs> Almost from the tip. <laughs> Just around the corner. On your way. See if you had any mates out there. <laughs> 